Hi, good afternoon and welcome to this marketplace. Um, I'm Claire Pierce. I'm your host for this session. I work as part of the Sustainability Hub Low Carbon Devon project team here at the University of Plymouth, um, which is an ERDF funded project designed to support Devon enterprises on their journey to net zero. So marketplace sessions, as you probably know by now, um, are an opportunity for our speakers to showcase their work. And our speakers across the whole conference come from a variety of different backgrounds. Today, in this room five, we have um, Carol Rose as our speaker. She is a creative practitioner whose experience in the fashion industry spans over 20 years, working with some of the UK's leading brands. Carol is an international speaker on the topic of incorporating ethical and sustainable principles in the fashion life cycle. Um, today, Carol will be talking specifically about redefining sustainability through nature's solutions. So, whilst Carol's speaking, please do put your thoughts, comments, and very importantly, questions into the chat. And at the end of the session, I will raise those questions with Carol. Um, most marketplaces have two speakers, but we have, we're lucky, we just have the one. Um, so, this presentation does have some video as well. So, um, we're expecting a very entertaining talk. Um, over to Carol Rose. Thank you. Good afternoon. I seem to have gone a bit of a skew with. Thank you, Claire, for that introduction and welcome everyone to this amazing event. I'm, I'm just so amazed and delightful to be taking part. I just wish it was live, but time will allow that. So as Claire says, I've been working in the fashion industry for some time. And um, let me just start sharing my presentation with you. Just to say the screens stop sharing, but I'm just going to, I should be sharing guys. So, Carol, if you bring your PowerPoint up to your screen. Right. Is that good? There. Perfect. Can you see it? Fabulous. Thank you. So um, I have been working a very long time in the fashion industry, well over 20 years. And I worked for some of the UK's leading brands, ranging from high street to luxury. I spent many good years uh, doing a job that I loved. I was getting around the world to the major garment producing regions, such as China, India, Vietnam, and Eastern Europe. And my job was to take a garment from concept through to in-store launch, and then to manage its, its customer response and returns. After a while, I started to experience what I felt like was a resounding feeling of cognitive dissonance. And this was becoming unbearable as I moved from role to role and company to company. I knew there was something not quite right with the way we were doing things, and there was constant pressure to develop and deliver product against tight deadlines. And there's the ethical part of fashion, um, which is a whole different story, for which I don't have time to discuss today. But I'm hoping as I move through the presentation, you get some idea of the magnitude of the issues that we're dealing with in the fashion industry. For anyone in, who knows the industry, um, the fashion life cycle is a complex fusing together of many disciplines and functions and services, working to find a symbiotic rhythm. I then became the sustainability advisor to SCAP, the Sustainable Clothing Action Plan. And here is where I found my feet and my calling, if you'd like. So what is SCAP? Uh, SCAP signed UK retailers responsible for supplying 50% by volume of clothing onto the UK market. And these signatories signed to pledge to reducing their carbon footprint of the textiles they supply by incorporating or implementing any one of these eight sustainable principles that you can see to the right of the screen. I then dis realized that when you were looking sort of given a global view and an overall view of what was happening on the sustainable side of fashion, I realized that we had created a beast, one that we would find very difficult to tame. And I hope that's really scary enough for you. So we are at Sustainable Earth 2021, addressing climate emergency and the race to net zero carbon 
And one year on from SCAP's deadline, what is the rate, the state of play in the fashion industry? There is still a lot of changes to be made with new challenges arising. And in doing my research, I found a well put together presentation by McKinsey and Company, which summarizes the state of play more succinctly than I could do. So if we can just click the link for this brief overview. Hello, Claire. Bear with me. No. Technical okay. issue. Sorry. Want me to do it or? In 2016, the United Nations signed a treaty to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. This is known as the Paris Agreement and pursues efforts to limit the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is often referred to as the 1.5 degree pathway. From rising sea levels to extreme rainfall and more powerful heat waves, the consequences of climate change can no longer be ignored, either by society or the fashion industry, which will see many impacts on its operations in the years ahead. In 2018, the fashion industry produced 2.1 billion tons of CO2. This represents 4% of global carbon emissions, an emission share larger than that of France, Germany, and the UK combined. Fashion needs to act on climate, and we need to change things fast. Because if we continue on our current path, we will miss our 2030 emissions targets by 50%, and this will accelerate global warming. So how does the fashion industry take on the challenge of massive CO2 reductions? Over the next 10 years, the fashion industry must intensify its efforts to cut CO2. In practice, that means embracing accelerated abatement to reduce annual emissions to around 1.1 billion tons, which is about half of today's figure. This sounds like a daunting task, but the good news is that 55% of these efforts will actually save money for the industry. In order to understand how we can reduce emissions, we need to understand the fashion value cycle. The fashion industry comprises a complex ecosystem of processes, products, and services. And this is what we define as a fashion value cycle. It encompasses material production, fabric preparation, wet processes, retail-related activities, garment usage, and end-of-use activities, such as recycling and circular business models. A diverse range of actors and intermediaries are part of this cycle, and all can play an active role in cutting greenhouse gas emissions and combating climate change. In fact, 60% of the accelerated abatement potential lies with suppliers and producers. 20% within brands and retailers own operations and 20% with customers. Everyone has a role to play. Manufacturers. Garment producers need to be fully committed to decarbonization programs to deliver accelerated abatement. For example, switching to renewable energy, making efficiency improvements in spinning, weaving, and knitting, and shifting to dry processing. However, producers will need support from brands to decarbonize. This is where 60% of abatement potential lies. So the industry needs to come together to make that happen through coordinated and collaborative approaches. Brands and retailers. Brands have direct control over for their own operations, but also have significant influence across the value cycle. At the moment, every fifth piece of garment ends up as garbage without ever being worn. So one of 
of the most effective things that brands and retailers can do together is to ensure that overproduction of clothes is reduced. Customers. By making small changes to the way we treat our clothes, customers can substantially reduce carbon emissions in the use phase. Things like skipping one in six washing loads, washing half of loads at below 30 degrees Celsius, and substituting every six dryer usage with open air drying can actually make a big impact. As well as adopting circular models, which could deliver 10% of accelerated abatement alone if one in five garments in 2030 are traded through circular models. Investors. 60% of this decarbonization requires some form of upfront investment. But fortunately, the positive link between environmental performance and financial performance means investors have a direct interest in creating incentives that promote change and enable fashion players to accelerate their efforts. Beyond 2030, even if accelerated abatement is achieved, the challenge gets tougher and the industry will need to decouple value growth from volume growth to stay on the 1.5 degree pathway. Only by daring to change, collaborate, and embrace new systems can we transform the industry and create prosperity for communities around the world. So, no matter where you are on the fashion value cycle, act today to safeguard our future. You can get the full story on how the fashion industry can fight climate change with more examples, facts, and inspiration in the McKinsey and Global Fashion Agenda Fashion on Climate Report at globalfashionagenda.com slash initiatives slash fashion on climate. The share screen. That and the R. Okay, thank you so much. So that, oh, it's not sharing. <laughs> oh, okay, lovely, thank you. So that um, I think is a real succinct summary of where we are at the moment, but there are opportunities for change and there must be a paradigm shift, shift towards a new textile economy. I'm really enjoying this quote from Sagrid Bernikov, which is uh, the program director of Mistra Future Fashion, and it states, understanding the true impact of the fashion industry requires an in-depth review of the value chain. Fibers are the first building block of this chain and a core element that needs to be understood to support the efforts on sustainable solutions for the, uh, the fashion industry and why fibers? Because fibers are converted to fabric and 75% of garments, of a garment's component is the fabric. The other 25% are made up of varied trims such as buttons, zips, interlining, threads, and sometimes embroidery. But apart from zips and buttons, everything else is essentially yarn base. So the industry must look at, must look at the source of our fibers and begin to move away from the use of synthetic fibers which have proven to be harmful to the human body and destructive to the in the environment and where are the fibers having the biggest impact polyester polyester was developed in 1940s and is derived from petroleum so it's a plastic molded filament or plastic molded into filament before this textile production was limited to the amount of land that would be allocated to growing natural fibers, such as linen and cotton. Polyester is found in 60% of garments we buy. And here on the side, you can see um, there's a breakdown of the percentage of the polyester market by sector, and a whopping 30% is used in apparel. Synthetics like polyester releases microfibers into the air and waterways and, and is finding its way into the food chain. Cotton. Cotton has been cultivated for over 5,000 years. And in the old days of hand picking, a farmer could harvest 200 pounds of cotton a day. Now with modern farming equipment and the invention of, I think at the time it was the, uh, a cotton, uh, a machine that separated the seeds from the bulbs. 200 pounds of cotton can be harvested in 19 seconds. 90 seconds, that's crazy. 27 million tons of cotton are produced each year. 
And this would equate to 27 t-shirts to everyone on the earth. And by 2028, it is estimated that cotton production is projected to reach 29 million tons. It's amazing. So what is the impact of com common fibers on the environment? Polyester is synthetic, so it does not decompose. It's non-renewable, -re so it's excavated from fossil fuels. It's toxic to the body and is now finding its way into the, the chain, in the food chain and, the, and tap water. It requires high amounts of energy to convert from fiber to fabric. It requires harsh chemicals to refine. It yields high water consumption. It is often genet genetically modified and there's high use of pesticides and in, in insecticides used in the fashion, in the growing of cotton. Um, and it's extremely harmful to the people who grow the crop. There is a documentary um, that was done about 10 years ago called Dirty White Gold. And it's a very insightful piece by director Leah Borromeo, who I've had the pleasure of working with. And it highlights the plight of 300,000 Indian farmers and the suicide rate to escape debt brought about by the industrialization of their industry. So knowing all of this and wanting to be responsible as a person who loves the fashion industry, I decided to do some research on what was going on in ancient times. I decided to research ancient theology and history, especially that of ancient Kemet, which we now call Egypt. I thought, well, here is one of the most advanced civilizations known to man. Ancient Kemet's wisdom is responsible for the development of our modern civilization. Developments such as language, writing, medicine, architecture, science, and astrology has, can be attributed to Kemetan uh, wisdom. They built ancient structures all around the world, such as the pyramids of Giza, which even with our modern minds and technology, science cannot give an account of how they built them. So what did they use for, for textiles, I thought? And I was just so surprised to discover that they worked with what nature produced. Silk, linen, and wool were the textiles of the era. I cannot, I mean, I'm gonna show a video just after this that presents what I've done with linen um, and silk and wool. But if I can just focus on linen at the moment, because it is deemed as a super fiber, a super textile, which we used to use before the advent of the advent of slavery uh, and the industrial revolution and the, the segue into uh, textiles for, for cotton. So the super properties of linen, linen as a, is a flax and the Latin name equates to most useful. At a biological cellular level, flax cells are highly complementary with human cells. Scientists have discovered that linen fibers are also reflect light at a high frequency, a frequency higher than humans. It's got hygienic properties. It's hyperallergenic, it's antibacterial. It requires minimum irrigation and it grows naturally with rainwater and energy from the sun. It also requires minimum energy in the refining process when you're converting it from, from plant and that picture at the top of the screen, that sort of dewy uh, plant scene is a uh, linen plant in growth. It's beautiful. Um, so it, it, re it, it requires minimum energy. So therefore it has a positive carbon footprint. It is also able to biodegrade and be composted to improve soil structure. So, I've put together Sovereign Fabrics, which is my contribution to the textile industry and how I feel we can use nature's products or nature's fibers in connection with technology and ethical business model, models. Please, could you uh, click the link and show the Sovereign Fabrics presentation or would you like me to do it? No, I'll do it, no worries. Okay. 
Nature speaks to us. The ancients of Kemet knew this. They understood that the energy from the sun, the wind and the water sustained Earth's flora and fauna. Fibers from nature were used in textiles, agriculture, medicine, and food. Linen, silk, and wool were chosen for their inherent healing and sustainable qualities. When cultivated and produced in an ethical way, they are much kinder to our bodies and the planet. The ancients knew that such natural fibers have a symbiotic connection with the earth and the human body, and that they carry inbuilt attributes closely related to our DNA. The Sovereign Fabrics brand takes a fresh look at nature's fibers to produce our fine lifestyle and fashion ranges. Our meticulous design and development process ensures that we are consciously creating with consideration for people and the planet. Experience the magic in your everyday life with some of the super properties of sovereign fabrics. Wool. High shape retention. Antibacterial. Insulator. Wicks moisture. Renewable. Linen allows airflow around the body, antibacterial, hyperallergenic, renewable. natural protein, hyperallergenic, antifungal, follows the natural contours and movement of the body, renewable. Every year the world dumps 15 million tons of textile waste to landfill. 90% of the disposed are synthetic textiles, which take hundreds of years to decompose. The use of harmful man-made synthetic fibres in the textile and the fashion industry 
are in direct conflict with Mother Nature's divine laws of personal responsibility, goodwill and love. We discovered that since the dawn of civilized man, hemp has been cultivated as another super plant based byproduct used for fabrics, food and medicine. We have included hemp to sovereign fabrics and introduced workwear and PPE produced to bespoke requirements. Sovereign fabrics created with conscience and redefining sustainability through nature's solutions. Am I back? Indeed. Thank you. So in my conclusion um, to the urgency to reduce uh, the impact of textiles on the environment, there must be a paradigm shift towards a new textile economy that incorporates circular econ economy and a fusion of technology, which meets human experience and input. And what I mean in, in incorporating um, the, uh, technology, it's not one to replace uh, human labor. It's one that should enhance human labor and the functions that cannot be done by humans. I believe we have to tap, tap into the moral law within where mind and soul must come together with respect for nature and fellow humans. And if I can quote one of my favorite fashion houses, Brunella Coccinelli, he quotes that we can, we can align ourselves with higher forces so we can beautifully create concepts that will take into consideration humanity and all within. There is an African proverb, Ubuntu. It simply means I am because we are. So with respect for the earth, reciprocity where communities and nations can agree to help each other without monetary exchange we can build a better future for the textile economy and its impact um, on climate change and globalization and in my research of ancient theology i discovered this uh, biblical definition of love which i think applies to so much that we do and it, I'm i've taken it from 1 Corinthians 3, 4, 7, and it says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes and always preserves. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> that was a really inspirational talk. And I put a link to your um, film in the chat there so anybody can um, contact or well, have a look at that again another time. So we've had some questions coming through for you. And the first one is, um, it's anonymous, but they've said, I'm starting to see more companies put labels on their clothes that are responsible cotton or recycled plastic. Do you think this sort of labeling just encourages green consumption? which continues the cycle of consumerism, or do you think it's a step in the right direction? I think when I started working in sustainability, um, I was a bit alarmed when I worked for SCAP because I felt that it wasn't a true um, authentic uh, consideration for the environment. It really was about ticking boxes, mm -hmm. but still we weren't looking at that triple bottom line. It was linear, it was more about profits. So I used to have a hard line, but then I realized that huge corporations have, it's very difficult to steer that beast <laughs> that we've created. So the fact that that even the consideration of using uh, BCI cotton, which is a, a standardized organic version of the cotton that's produced normally, is a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of greenwashing going on, um, but I think that um, the, the industry has a way to go to embrace fully what sustainability means. 
um, and it incorporates ethics. It, it needs to look at uh, polyester or synthetics. The, the, the fact that we are trying to retrieve from the earth the enormous amount of plastics that we consume, not just in textile, but in everyday products um, and, and recycle those into um, other products is, is considerable, it's, it's commendable, but there's also the, um, the other side of that where the microplastics um, or the microfibers, what we call, from those plastics get released in through the washing machine because the fibers are so small they escape through the, the filters and back into the waterways and ultimately the ocean. So my thing is, we, we, how did we get here in the first place? So as we move towards the what they call the fourth or the fifth industrial revolution um, with technology, we need to use technology to enhance um, what we what nature has given us and eventually move away from the use of synthetic fibers for all the right reasons, because it's harmful to our bodies and it's harmful to the environment, but that's gonna take a, uh, take a, take a while because it, it, it revolves around a mindset change. Absolutely, as mm -hmm. I think a lot of that has been discussed during the whole conference, that mindset change and what that light bulb moment is for individual people. Um, we've got another question actually, which links very nicely to that. Mm -hmm. And they're asking, um, is it better just to dump all synthetic clothing now to reduce pollution or to continue using them and washing them which then obviously leads to those microfibers so what should we do with what's in the system already well that is a really great question which i haven't actually thought about how do we work with what is already in the system you see i think recycling is a good thing but i think i'm tasking anyone that's into computer science into technology to think of a way that we can redistribute or recycle plastics, in particular textiles, into a version of something that doesn't have a redirection into the air and into our, our waterways. And that is something I think we can overcome with technology. Look, we're, we're sending rockets to the moon, right? We're, we're thinking of going, there's this whole drive towards an, you know, the moon being the next place that we can inhabit then therefore we can direct our science and our tech and our thinking towards reducing or re-implementing another state for synthetics um, yeah. as, as it stands, yes. That's a really good answer actually. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another question here from Sepade Kulsavi, one of my colleagues. Um, <laughs> how can we provide more affordable, sustainable clothing? So for example, um, you've got Popular Eco, which is a sustainable and vegan friendly clothing brand that follows the latest trends and they're more expensive. So how can we make sustainable clothing more accessible? The major companies have got to reduce their costs, their, their profit, simple as that. Um, I think if you look at a, the average um, cost of making a T-shirt in Bangladesh, for instance, the, um, say if you, I don't know, if we, I'm not gonna call names of any of the retailers that we have in the UK, but if you took a typical high fashion retailer the average cost of a cotton t-shirt is probably about 14 pounds, seven to 14 pounds. It might be a little bit lower than that. But the garment maker gets 18 pence per t-shirt. And, the, and there's the fabric, which is, as I've um, demonstrated earlier, that it's 75% of the cost or the component of the garment. So that's where a lot of the cost is incurred. But if you offset that against the huge profits that the, can, that the major players in fashion um, turn over each year, there has to be a compromise so that when we are developing um, sustainable, ethically produced products, it's a reachable, it's, a, it's attainable by everyone. My brand, um, I, the, I took, I've taken a long time over my brand because one of the things I wanted to alleviate was the cost how do I charge for these products that are working on a slow fashion cycle? So we don't make products every season. We're not turning products around every two weeks, like what is happening in the fashion industry. And we're not even working to season. We create beautiful things that we want individuals to engage with. We want individuals to preserve as an heirloom. So it's, it's, it's staying loved for longer. Um, and, I had to structure a pricing architect that I felt was 
attainable, but also we've got to pay people. We've, unfortunately, if I could give it away for free, I would, because I believe in that exchange of, of Ubuntu, but I live in a world that says I have to pay for my living, I have to pay a mortgage, I have to pay for gas, I have to pay for car, I have to pay for electricity and food, we all do. So therefore, if I'm spending 80% of my time producing something, there must be a monetary return. So the way we've done it is that there will be a, a payment scheme. So you have other ways of buying your product. You can actually uh, set up a payment plan with the payment channels that we have, or you can buy it outright. Um, and we're not high street prices because love has been put in the product. It's meant to be kept, but it's really about focusing on your business model. And maybe someone, if there's a, a, a chairman from a high street retailer on this platform, I'd like to know how profits are being dispersed <laughs> against shareholders because there needs to be a balance somewhere that that directly uh, you know, gives back to the consumer. Because I believe the responsibility lies with the producer and the brands to, to take on and become responsible for what we put out and what we offer to the consumer. I think it was Steve Jobs that said that the consumer doesn't know what it wants until the inventor or the creator puts it out there. That's an interesting point, which leads me to another question that's in the feed, which is as well as those producers, do we need as a society, a complete culture change regarding, <clears throat> sorry, our relationship to clothing and fashion? I say that separately because for some people, fashion isn't important, it's clothing. But do we need to change our relationship? So, for example, we've seen recently on, on the television, you can hire, borrow, swap clothes as opposed to buying. Do we need to embrace that sort of approach? Yes. Um, I think that um, swapping and hiring is a very, very um, interesting business model with, um, a, you know, that with, with mileage in it. But in terms of our connection to uh, clothing, when I was with RAP, we discovered we, in our research, we realized that um, longevity had two, two arms. One was functional. So we became disassociated or disconnected from our product because it functionally didn't work. And there was another um, arm which was emotional where we, dis we disconnected because we just didn't like the color or we didn't like the um, the way it fit. You know, does my bum look big in this <laughs> type of thing? <laughs> and so how do you overcome what humans, how human beings work on an emotional level and their connectivity with product? I'm a creative and I create something that I want people to engage and love. That's why we do it. We just want someone to get a little piece of what we've visioned. But until we as a, as a society move back to self, which is the Ubuntu, something that I mentioned in the beginning. And that that inner com, uh, connectivity with a higher self, because it really is about self. Before we can design a product or create a huge and amazing piece of technology, we exist <laughs> and everything comes from a thought. So that cultural change needs to come from within. And when we actually go within, there's no end to what we can actually create. And we have the ability to do that and to ch make changes on this planet and within our respective industries and disciplines if we only but took that second to reflect on the self. And do we do to someone or something what we wouldn't like for self? What are you handing over to your friend, to your mother, to the next generation? That's the wake up call. And who knows what can happen from there. Mm -hmm. And that's a great note to end on. Thank you, Carol Rose. That's fantastic. And thank, <laughs> thank you, Marie, for joining us. And um, please do remember to keep putting your chats, your thoughts in the feed, but also the discussion boards on the, on the platform. And um, we have a couple more sessions left, so please choose carefully and um, hopefully see you again soon. Thank, thank you, Claire. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.